God is good. Um, and if we're, really, if we're really willing to uh, think about the goodness of God, it's overwhelming to all of us. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 is where we're going to go tonight to start. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Um, I'm going to get a workout myself tonight. I'm going to move around a lot just because I'm really nervous. So I'm going to go up and down the stairs and drink a lot of water and break a sweat and have some fun with it. But the Lord truly is good to all of us. We're going to talk about that a little bit tonight here. Um, And then what should that mean to us all? Because God's been so good to us all. Uh, Life isn't probably what we want it to be sometimes, but God's still good. You might not have all the things we want in life, but God is still good. Situations in life might not be what we want them to be, but God is still good. And I've seen that true in my life. And as we look at 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse number 15, just one verse uh, here tonight. If this is all we had to be thankful for, it would be enough. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse number 15. Thanks be, to, be unto God for his unspeakable gift. Amen. During this time of the year, we talk about that gift a lot in Jesus Christ. And as we look here tonight and what that should mean to our lives, and as we look at another two passages as well, throughout this season, I just challenge you as the Lord has challenged me to think about that gift. And how if for all of us in here, and hopefully all of us in here, how it's changed all of our lives. Jesus Christ. For me, I know for me personally, I would not be where I am tonight for sure. Standing in front of all of you, talking, not my favorite thing to do. But if it wasn't for Jesus Christ, I wouldn't be here. And that's enough. And in my life, what I've tried my best to do is to make sure that that is enough. There's a lot of things that the Lord has blessed me with in my life and a lot of things I've gotten to do in my life. But I always want to come back to the point that Jesus Christ has to be enough for me. Because all those things that I've gotten to do and all those things that I have in my life could all go away and they are all going to go away one day. And Jesus Christ still has to be enough. So we'll pray. And then the... uh, the, uh, we'll get started here tonight. So, dear Lord, we thank you so much for that unspeakable gift of your son, Jesus Christ, to us all, Lord, and to the world. But I pray, Lord, as we talk about how generous you are to us all, I pray, Lord, that we focus at ourselves and see what we're doing with that generosity in our lives. I pray, Lord, that you just use me, Lord, as your vessel. Empower me, Lord, with your spirit and your power to do and say exactly what you want me to tonight. I pray, Lord, that you be with our great Uh, church family, Lord, tonight as well. But during this time of year, Lord, where we think about so many different things, I pray that we just focus on you for a few minutes tonight, Lord, and I pray that you just bless this time. May your spirit, Lord, be upon this place, and I pray all this, Lord, in your name. Amen. As I said at the beginning, if we're truly willing to think about it, God's been good to all of us in so many different ways. My dad taught me at a young age to be thankful to walk, uh, to be really thankful for walking. Um, I played a lot of sports growing up, so I had to walk to play those sports, I guess. Uh, But my dad always taught me to be thankful for that. And I remember watching a video on ESPN, a little sports plug there, I guess. So watching a video on ESPN where there was this young child who was born with no legs. Um, And he was uh, taken, again, uh, by this wrestling coach who taught him to wrestle. And he had no legs, and he was taught to wrestle, and some of you might have seen it before. It was an incredible story, you know, right? You sit back at some of those stories, and there's plenty of stories like that. You're like, man, right? I mean, I have more than that kid does, and what am I doing? Like, you watch that video, and I can't do half the things that kid is doing on a wrestling mat. He's just incredible. And yet we're, and you watch things like that, and you look at your life, and he's like, man, thank you, Lord, for giving me what I have, right? I went on a mission trip to the Philippines twice, and... You go to places like that, and I know Pastor Scott has been there, and you go to places like that, and then you come back home, and it's like, man, we have so much, and we truly do, and we live in a great country in America that we're blessed to be able to do things like this tonight and have a service and be able to have a home that we own and be able to have things that we're able to enjoy because we live in this great country, and God's been good to all of us. The story of the Bible 
is filled with so much of that truth, God's generosity. Throughout Scripture, you see it from the beginning in Genesis chapter 1, and it's filled throughout the entire Bible of God being generous to Adam and Eve, to the children of Israel, and to us even now. But yet the challenge then for us as Christians is what are we doing with that generosity that God's given us? Do we, as I have and as sometimes as we all struggle with, tend to focus on the things that we have more than the things that we can give away? We focus more on the things that we want to get more than the things that we already have and being grateful for them. We tend to focus, especially because this world and especially in the country that we live in is so focused on material things and so focused on what you can have personally and that's what gives you your worth. But yet for us as Christians, Jesus Christ is what gives us our worth. As we said, that's enough. But yet if that's enough, then yet why is our focus so much of our time focus on other things. And we spend our times for ourselves and bringing joy to ourselves and making sure that we're taken care of and making sure that we're okay. Generous living is a lifestyle where we are others focused. It's not a one size fits all concept and it's not limited to the wealthy, to the gifted, the beautiful or the lucky. It's a journey of our hearts being transformed to get to one point one day where it's not what can I get, but it's more what can I give. It's allowing God to cultivate a generous heart within us. Now the funny thing is, and I've been here before, is that we look at our lives and we look at what we own and what we have and that's what makes us what matters, I guess, right? If I own a car, then I'm good. Me and my wife, we sold uh, one of our cars this summer, and the Lord was really gracious to us and allowed us to sell it at a great price, I thought. And then we were down to one car. Man, life is hard. <laughs> right? We work at the same place. We work here at the church. We both teach here at the school. And we're still having a hard time with one car. And then we struggled, like, who's going to pick up who? I'm going to drop you off at this time. You know, now you're going to have to sit at church because I can't get there at that time. And you got to figure all these things out with one car. We laugh about those things, but it's true. In the world that we live in, especially in our lives, that's what we struggle with sometimes. But yet we live in a world that God created, and he created it in a way that it has enough for us to survive. It does. Forget about what you hear in the news that the world's gonna die soon or whatever. We do have enough. But yet our mindset sometimes is is that we don't have enough. And then when God asks us to do something, uh, I can't, because I don't have enough. He wants me to give, I can't, don't have enough. He wants us to give our time, uh, don't have enough. He wants us to give of the things that we have, and it's, no, those are mine. And we lose sight of what our lives are truly supposed to be all about. And that's generous, generosity, giving of ourselves, of the things that God has blessed us with, of everything. Now, that all sounds good until, as all of us do, and as I have especially, begin to doubt God's generosity. So we're going to go to two passages. So this side of the room, we're going to go to Matthew chapter 6, all right? So you got to help me out here. This side of the room is going to go to Matthew chapter 6, okay? This side of the room is going to go to Luke chapter 12, okay? Very similar passages here, okay? Pretty much the same passages. The middle people get to go to both. Sorry, you sat in the middle. That's your punishment. The middle section gets to go to both. So Matthew chapter 6. Luke chapter 12, for Matthew chapter 6, we're going to start in verse number 25. For Luke chapter 12, we're going to start in verse number 22. Okay? Now we're going to look at one passage. You don't have to go there, but Psalms 24, verse number 1 is going to be up on the screen. Okay? The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The world and, what's the next word there? They that dwell therein. Okay? So... I think this is a simple biblical truth, but we know that God's in control. God knows everything. 
God knows everything about us. God knows everything about our lives. God knows everything about what we're going through. God understands everything. Everything we see, it's his. And at the same time, we are his. Okay, so as we look at these passages in Matthew chapter 6, and then in Luke chapter 12, just have that understanding. God's in control. God knows what he's doing. God knows everything about my life. God knows everything that I'm going through. So in Matthew chapter 6, verse number 25. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what he shall eat or what he shall drink, nor yet for your body what he shall put on. It is not life for then meat and the body then raiment. Behold, the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take your thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you? Next couple words here. Together for this side. O ye of little faith. Okay. Luke chapter 12, if you were following along, pretty much the same thing. And we have a God who's talking to his disciples and he's telling them, hey, I'm in control. Don't worry about your own life. I know what I'm doing. But yet it comes down to that thought, O oh, ye of little faith. Because if God asked me to give something that I don't want to give, then that's when we start to second guess God. And I've been there. Every year, and I seem to talk about this all the time, but we have summer preaching conference, and we know that preachers are coming in, and we know that now Pastor Olet and now Pastor Hal are going to say, you know what, at the end we're going to give an offering. And yet I've been there, and I've sat there, and now the church given the, has given us every single way, and I apologize because I have something to do with that, where we have no excuse on how you can give. You can give through your phone. You can give with your own wallet. You can fill out a little envelope. You can do and give a bunch of different ways. But yet I've sat in my seat and been like, ah, oh, I don't have anything. I don't have any cash, right? Been there. Oh, I don't want to use my debit card even though it's already typed in on push pay. But yet, God's telling me to give. And then we had faith building offering, and then we'll have stewardship offering, and we'll have all these different times where God's going to challenge us to be generous. Or simply just to give. And yet we doubt what he can do. And yet we second guess, God, do you really know what you're doing? Do you not know my current situation? Do you not know what I'm going through? Do you not know the bills that I have coming up? Do you not know the car payment that I have? Do you not know the house payment that I have? Do you not know the food that I have to buy? or Whatever we want to come up with, but he already knows. But yet, like I said at the beginning, thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. But yet when we're facing times like that, that's not what we're thinking about. We're thinking about ourselves. And again, that's the greatest struggle we have as Christians is that we think about ourselves. And it's not about what Jesus Christ wants us to do anymore. It's our situation now. And it's not about the blessing that God has for us now. It's about, I can't do this. But yet, that's the world that we live in. In the world that's scared that we're going to lose everything. In a world that says, hey, we don't have enough, so make sure that you and your own are taken care of. Make sure that yourself and your family or whatever, make sure that you're taken care of. Make sure that you have enough before you can give to somebody else. Make sure that you're taken care of before you give up your time, your efforts, your abilities, your talents, whatever. 
make sure that you're okay before you focus on somebody else. But yet that's not how it's supposed to be for us as Christians. I'm supposed to focus on everybody else before I focus on myself. Because that's what Jesus Christ did. And yet we're glad that he did that. Man, I'm standing up here and saying, hey, I'm glad that Jesus Christ didn't think of himself when he was going to the cross. I'm glad that he was thinking about all of us. But yet when we're put in a similar situation, we think about ourselves before we think about him. So it really comes down to that. O ye of little faith. We are deceived by the ultimate lie, the idea that God hasn't given us what we need to flourish. God, if I had more, how much more I can do for you? God, if I had this, I could be so much more profitable for you. God, if you gave me the ability to do this, man, so much more I can do for you. We think that sometimes. God, if I didn't meet, make these choices, maybe you could use me. Or God, if I wasn't in this situation or in this job or wherever, you could use me. We think that. God, if my financial situation wasn't what it's supposed to be or what it currently is, I can give so much more to you. But he's given us enough. We just doubt that. We doubt that he's in control. We doubt that he doesn't know what's going on. But he knows. In the Bible, when the world begins to operate out of a distrustful scarcity mindset, we begin to justify selfish behavior. We see it throughout the Bible. We see it especially with the children of Israel. We see it in the book of Genesis with Abraham doubting that God knew what was going on in his life. We see it in so many different stories, but yet we're like, ah, different situation. And yet we see the outcomes of those choices. We see all the outcomes of the children of Israel when they decided to doubt God. And we see what happened to them, but yet we say, no, not applicable to me. Different situation, different time of the world. But yet, we're supposed to learn from those stories. And we're supposed to learn from their examples so that we don't do the same thing. But yet, if we're truly willing to examine our lives, we do the same things. We doubt God constantly. Not only when it comes to money, and I know that's the focus, but even when it comes to our time. When it comes to the talents that God has given us, and when it comes to the abilities that God has given us, and when it comes to the influence that God has given us, we doubt. My question again tonight is why? God is good. To all of us, he has been. But yet we focus on ourselves and that's what gets us in trouble. Every time. As a teenager, life was about me. It was. I was popular in a sense. I was good at sports. Everybody knew my name. Life was all about me. But yet I still wasn't happy. I could score as many points as I wanted to on the basketball court. I could make as many touchdowns as I wanted to on the football field. I can hit as many home runs as I wanted to in baseball. But all I have from all that is just pain every single day. That's <laughs> all I get. My knees hurt, my back hurts. Kids make fun of me at school because I walk like an old person. It's what I get. It means nothing. My dad tried to teach me that when I was young. My dad tried his best to teach me, my brother, and my sister, of course, to be generous with what the Lord has given us. I saw an example of my dad when it comes to generosity. He was a great example of it. I remember as a 13-year-old, my dad started his business, and it was a big deal, right? Um, my dad became a citizen of the United States when I was 12, and he knew more about American history than I did, and I was going to school learning about American history. And he took the test, and he became a citizen, and that was a big deal for my dad and my mom. It was cool. You look back at it now as a teenager, and it's like, that was awesome. And then he started his own business. He was super excited. But it was hard at first. Some of you have been there when it comes to something like that. It was tough. Times were tough. But yet my dad still gave. 
And I would help my dad with some of his finances and I understood some of the things that we were going through and I understood that we didn't have a lot of money, but yet he still gave. And one of the things that really stood out to me is one of my aunts, uh, my, one of my dad's sisters, uh, needed brand new tires for a car. And my dad, I remember the conversation, my dad and my mom were talking about it. And my dad's like, this is what I feel like the Lord wants us to do. And, you know, as parents, you know, you talk about that and hope you, your kids don't listen or whatever. And he bought her four brand new tires. And it was literally all he had that week. Felt that's what the Lord wanted him to do. And then you sit there, and, and for me, as a 13-year-old, and you wonder, it's like, what is he doing? Well, he's doing what the Lord wants him to do. And then I look back and see how the Lord blessed him so much more than that. And then for me to be like, it's seeing an example, and so many more that I could tell you of my own personal life, and, and God puts me in a situation similar to that, and be like, ah, I don't know, God. You know what I'm going through? You know my current situation? You know, I can't do that. What scares me sometimes is the blessing that we miss because that's our attitude. We have no idea what God has on the other side. And we hear stories about that all the time. Like, you know what? I gave 20 bucks, I got 100. Or I gave of my time and I was blessed because of it. I was talking to Nathan. We went on a, a quad trip up at Kobiak and... Mr. Koblis was there, and we were talking about this concept, and Nathan just bought a quad for that trip. He was super excited, and he didn't break it or anything, praise the Lord. He didn't die under my supervision, although his dad was there, so he could have. I didn't care. Um, but we were talking about, you know, for Nathan, you know, as a teenager, if God asked him to give his quad away, he just paid a lot of money for it, got to enjoy it up at that trip, and let's say there was a kid up there didn't have one. And God puts it on Nathan's heart to give his quad away. That'd be tough. I'm with you there. Just paid a couple hundred for a quad. Uh, I get it. But if he gives it away, and if that's what God wants him to do, is he going to be better off or worse off? Better off, right? We would say that. Okay, if we're honest, yeah, he's going to be better off. Now, sometimes we have this mindset. Man, you're going to get a better quad. You gave your quad away, God's going to give you a better one. Sometimes he doesn't. Maybe the gift is seeing somebody else happy. But yet in our lives, I mean, let's be honest, sometimes that's not good enough. I want to be happy. Wait, I just spent a bunch of money on this quad. Why does that kid need to be happy? I want to be happy. But yet that's not what we're taught. And that's not the example that's given to us in scripture of generosity. It's not me thinking of me. It's me thinking of others. So we see that first, the example. Jesus in the New Testament is portrayed as God's response to a history of human selfishness. Time and time again, the world that God created made it all about themselves. So then God sent his son to get rid of that selfishness in the world. But it's still here. Even amongst Christians who shouldn't be selfish, it's still here. Why? It's because we have the mindset that what I have is mine. What I own is mine. And if I have to give it away, what, am I, what do I have now? It's because we feel like what we own is what makes us what we are. But Jesus is what makes us what we are. He is all I need. Christ is all I need. Christ is all I need. But wait, I got to give this up. No, he's not all I need. Now, trust me, I understand how difficult it is. It's not like I'm standing up here and I'm a billionaire and I can just give money away. Would be nice, though. 
But even if I had a billion dollars, still not mine. And even if I have one dollar, still not mine. So if God asks me to give it away, give it away. The time that I think is so precious to me, not mine. So if God asks me to give it away, give it away. If God asks you to be generous with your time, if God's asking you to be generous with your talents, if God is asking you to be generous with your abilities, then do it. Because it's not about you or me. It's about him. So then as Christians, let's live that way. Let's be a church. And again, I've been here for 10 years, and I think, and I tell people this all the time, you guys are the best church family out there. You truly are. When it comes to us, especially me as a teacher, you guys are extremely generous. You guys have been for 10 years, and your giving and your support and your encouragement, you guys are awesome. So it's not like I'm talking to people who don't know this truth. But yet, still God sometimes asks us to do more, and yet we hold back. And then I look at my life when I do it. And then God hits me upside the head, and it's like, why did I do that? It doesn't make any sense. Why am I holding on to this, whatever it is, like it's the last thing I own? And I've done that with $10. And I've done that with time that I feel is so precious to me while I'm taking a nap. <laughs> because it's all about me. And that's what gets us in trouble. But the example that's set before us isn't one of that. It's one of sacrifice, and it's one of giving, and it's one of generosity, and it's one of, hey, it's not my life. I am here to do what God wants me to do. That's the example of Jesus that we get. And that's the example that we read about in Matthew chapter 6 and in Luke chapter 12. Hey, don't worry about yourself because if God's taking care of the birds and if God is taking care of the plants, you're much more important than they are. I'm going to take care of you. But yet we lose sight of that. Who's ever bird watched? Okay, I, a lot more people than I thought would. What an activity. I'm going to sit down and watch birds do whatever birds do. And I'm going to try to find different kinds. I'm going to point them out. I went to a park a long time ago when I was a teenager, uh, east, uh, west side of Lancaster, and there was a guy at the park drawing the birds that he was seeing. Okay, cool, man. But yet, when you look at those birds, if you're willing to, okay, now it's hard for me just to sit down and not do anything, although I am looking at birds, I get it. But when you see them, they're not worried about life. They're not worried about their life. They're not worried about what they're going to eat next. It's coming sooner or later. But yet, that's the example that's given to us. Hey, they don't worry because I'm going to take care of them. You don't worry because I'm going to take care of you. What an amazing God. Hey, don't worry, you're taken care of. And he's telling us that already. Before he tells us, hey, give this, he's saying, don't worry about anything, you're going to be taken care of. The example then is, are we going to do that? Jesus Christ did. Oh, he trusted his father. All the way to the end. Will we then follow that example and trust God all the way to the end? Because look at your life, my life especially, I haven't always done that. And the scary thing is, what have I missed out on because of it? I have no idea. Imagine if we can look back and be like, you know what, you didn't do that, you missed out on a billion dollars or you miss out on a brand new car, or you miss out on a brand new quad, or maybe you just missed out on joy, or maybe you missed out on learning patience, or maybe you missed out on learning gratitude, or maybe you missed out on just a blessing to be to somebody else. I don't know. But in my life, I don't wanna to have to ask that question anymore. The Holy Spirit tells me to do something, I just wanna do it. 
And then whatever happens, happens. Either way, obedience to me is enough. Has to be. Jesus chooses to go without adequate food and shelter, and he reached out to the homeless and hungry in order to share God's abundance with them. Ultimately, Jesus allows the selfishness of his own people to kill him, and he overcomes their evil with his generous love in the resurrection of his life. We are invited then, as his children, to live as if God's abundant kingdom has truly arrived here and now, because it has. If we're truly willing to say Christ is all I need, then his kingdom is here. And we could be an example to the entire world of Jesus Christ is enough. But do we want to be that example? Do we want to have that testimony of Christ is enough? Number two, I only have three points. The expectation. We are challenged as Christ followers to imitate his same life of generosity towards others. Living generously requires a posture of trust in God And it's all rooted in the conviction that God has given us all we need. So he wants all of us to be generous because we all truly believe that he's given us all we need. And if I give everything away, he's still going to give me everything I need. And if I give everything away again, he's still going to give me everything I need. And if he tells me to do it again, He's still going to give me everything I need. But are we willing to live that way? Now, I've been asked this question before. Has God ever asked you to give everything away? Everything. If we were to write down a list of everything we have, I don't think, now maybe he might, I don't think God's going to ask any of us to give everything away down to the last sock that doesn't have a pair at home. But if he did, you're expected to. If he asks you to give $10, give it. You're expected to. If he asks you to give 30 minutes, you're expected to. If he's asking you to give of your talents, you're expected to. Whatever he asks, you're expected to give. Not hold back, not keep to yourself, because it's not mine anyway. It's his. So if we're following Jesus Christ the way that we should, that's our expectation. To give. Whatever. Whatever he asks, just give. Whatever he says to do, just do. Wherever he says to go, go. No questions. Nothing. Just go. Just give. If Jesus gave the ultimate gift of his own life for us, despite our selfishness and failure, then the only reasonable response is to extend that same loving gift to others. If he was willing to do it, I have to be willing to do it. He gave of his life, I have to be willing to give of my life. Because that's the example and that's the expectation. Number three, the encouragement. We should live, and here's a quote, more simply and give more generously because heaven is our home. The single greatest deterrent to giving and living more simply is the illusion that this world is our home. We hold on to what we have here like if it matters. But yet we're on that mindset that it does matter. And this is what makes me. And this is all I have. But it's not. So letter A here underneath number three, let us be generous with our time. Some challenge is here tonight. Be generous with your time. Trust me, I believe sometimes I don't have enough time in the day to get everything done. 
seems like every day I'm going to tell this story. Principal at the school here this year, it's been a lot of fun. A kid came in crying into the office, asking him, what's going on? A kid took my ball. I want my ball back. Crying. Okay, first of all, I just want to laugh. It's a ball. Right? It's just a ball. But that's the most important thing to him. But yet, five minutes with him, you calm him down, you give him a piece of candy, talk to him for a little bit, make his day. It was worth it. No longer was he thinking about the ball. He was glad I gave him a piece of candy. I let him sit in my chair in my office, thought it was the coolest thing ever. Poked around on the keyboard that I have on my desk, was having a blast. The ball didn't matter anymore. Now I lost about seven and a half minutes of stuff that I was doing. I had to go back on the file and delete all the things that he typed on it. <laughs> but those seven and a half minutes was worth it. So now that same kid comes in my office now, sits on the couch, just wants to talk, tell me about his day as a K-5 student, how he has so much going on. <laughs> it's worth it. Here's a quote, the measure of life after all, it's not its duration, but it's donation. What of your time are you willing to give? God's going to ask you to do it sometimes. God's going to tell you to give of your time. God's going to ask you to be an example. God's going to ask you to be a servant. God's going to ask you to be a friend. Sometimes we say, I just don't have the time. We all have time. The question is, are we making time for the important? And sometimes we lose sight of what truly is important. Secondly here, let us be generous with our abilities. Great quote here, John Bunyan. You have not lived today until you have done something for someone who can never repay you. Sometimes... We focus on what somebody can give me or what someone can do for me. I want to be friends with that person because of what they can do for me. Our lives can't be that. Especially in the city that we live in, there's a lot of people that can never do anything back for us. But yet we're supposed to be giving to those people all the time. And even if somebody can repay you back, doesn't matter, because that's not the reason why. And our abilities, your skills, your gifts, your talents, be generous with them. God's given us those anyway. Amen. And I've seen how easily they can be taken away. I used to, as a teenager, a long time ago, used to be able to grab the rim when I jumped. Now, I'm not that tall, I'm five foot eight. I was at Dr. Martin's office getting my back worked on because I guess it's really bad. All the things I did as a kid, jumping off trucks, jumping off the roof, falling, snowboarding, playing football, didn't help any of that. So I got measured. He was like, how tall do you think you are? I was like, I think I'm like 5'6". I think I got shorter, my old age. And then he was like, no, you're 5'8". I was like, oh, I got taller. That's awesome. I'm going the other way. But even with our gifts and talents, like I was saying, I, I used to be able to grab the rim. thought it was the coolest thing ever. So I'm going to dunk a basketball one day. Dunk the volleyball. Yeah, all my friends went crazy. You dunked the volleyball. That's so cool. One game later, the Lord's, the Lord's humor. Twisted my ankle. Never able to do it again. <laughs> spent all that time working out. Spent all that time lifting weights. Spent all that time practicing. And it was gone. It's not mine. And when I make it mine, most of the time, that's when we tend to lose it. So the skills and gifts and talents that God's given you, use them for his glory. Don't hold on to them. They're not yours anyway. God's given us all those. So use it for his honor and glory. Let us see. Let us be generous with our possessions. The world asks, what does a man own? 
Christ asked, how does he use it? Everything that God's giving you, what do you do with it? Do you keep it to yourself? Do you put it off in a safe? Whatever it is, highly important to you. But yet God's asking, what do you do with it? He's given us everything we have. Everything we own. It's because he's given it to us. So what are we doing with it? In the Bible, Jesus spoke in parables 39 times. 11 of them are about money and possessions. Clearly, Jesus knew this would be a struggle. He understood how possessions can have a hold on us sometimes. And it takes us away from how we should live our lives. Letter D, lastly here, let us be generous with our life. Romans 12, verse 1, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Last quote here. When we're in trouble in life, we run to the cross when we need God. But when God calls, but when God calls us, we want to cross-examine him. When we're in trouble, he's the first one we go to. But when he calls us, uh, God, do you know what you're doing? God, do you know what you're talking about? God, do you know my situation? God, do you know what I'm going through? But that's what we do in our lives. We tend when life is good and God calls to question him. Don't. He knows what he's doing. He understands who you are. He understands what your situation is. He understands what your abilities are. He's just asking you to trust him. May it not be said about us, O ye of little faith. Dear Lord, thank you so much for your generosity to us all. And as was mentioned, Lord, if we're willing to really think about it, you have been so good to us. But yet sometimes that goodness, Lord, is taken advantage of in the sense of we keep, we keep, we keep. I ask, Lord, for my life that I no longer do that. But that I give, give, and give. Thank you so much for that unspeakable gift. And Lord, how your son, Jesus Christ, is enough. A few questions tonight. Maybe you are holding on to some of these earthly things too much. Maybe you are holding on to possessions or your time or your abilities and not using them for the glory of God. You say, you know what, Pastor Galdemez, that's me. I'm holding on to these things a little too much. And they're taking me away from the things that God wants me to do. If that's you, just raise your hand. You know what? I'm holding on to things a little too much. My time, way too important to me. Thank you. As the music begins to play, you know what? If you're saying, God, I got to give more because you've given me so much. As the music begins, just come down. We all need God's help. God, you've been so good to me. I want to be generous with what you've given me.